I just want to talk about this work, which I, uh, which actually has been written up, but we are revising, making the final draft. Hopefully, it'll soon be on the archive. And it's joint work with uh, Philippe Michel and my student Lian Yang, who's really really good, and he's finishing this year. But this is not part of his thesis. I should confess, of course, I wouldn't do that for his thesis. But um, <clears throat> anyway, this is the joint work. Let me try to explain things from scratch. Since this is a number theory seminar, so I will focus on that, but still there will be some representation theory that I will try to explain. Okay. All right, so let's start with the L-series and Selberg class. So these are the kinds of things I'm interested in. So these, you start with the Dirichlet series. And um, I mean, sorry, I have to move this way. Yeah, okay. And then which is uh, some an over n to the s and and I'm going to assume so these are the things I want to assume that it converges absolutely when the real part of s is greater than one, like the Riemann zeta function, and satisfies the following axiom that it has analytic continuation to the whole plane except possibly for a pole at s equal to one. And then I'm going to assume even that uh, that you have Ramanujan conjecture that is. A n is bounded by some constant times n to the epsilon. For, for all epsilon, you have the bound. And um, this is, a, of course, the bound depends on epsilon. So then um, this looks very strong to assume, but it will turn out that the forms we are considering due to the work of many people, one knows that the Ramanujan conjecture holds for that. So, so in representation theory, they would say you're dealing with tempered automorphic forms. It's the same thing. Okay, and then it'll have a functional equation. So it's normalized like Selberg has done. It goes from S to one minus S. Representation theorists would say it's unitary normalization. So in general, you'll see things like S goes to K minus S when you look at holomorphic forms of weight K, but I will always normalize it so that they go from S to one minus S. And I would be interested in the center, S equals one high. Okay, so then I'm also gonna assume that the real part of S greater than one, there's an Euler part. So these are the basic assumptions. And I'll look at one special class of L functions uh, for which one can prove something. Anyway, as I've written here, the examples, standard examples are the Riemann zeta function, LS chi, which are the Dirichlet L functions, where chi is a Dirichlet character, or it could be like a Gaussian character of a, of a number field, for example, an imaginary quadratic field. And, um, and then you, LSF denotes the L function of some modular form, F. And then more generally, LS pi, where pi will be some automorphic representation of GLM, which is a generalization of classical modular forms. Okay, so we are, our basic interest is in these L functions which has been studied a lot and, and um, okay. And so now I'm just giving the Euler products here. I just wanna make one quick remark here. The Riemann zeta function, everybody knows this Euler product, which is really due to Euler. And, um, and the Dirichlet L function. So both of them have uh, the factors of degree one. And when I put the squiggly equal sign, it means it's true up to some, modifications, that's a finite number of factors. So at finite number of factors, even for Dirichlet L function, uh, when chi is ramified at P, then uh, the factor will be just one. So there are always some reductions that happen at bad prime, so I will ignore this. And for the questions I'm interested in, it won't make much difference. It's very important when one wants to have the exact formula for the L value, but I will ignore this for now. And then uh, the, if you take the modular form, classical modular form, LSF, then we look at this Euler product, then we see that the Euler factors of degree two. We say, that's why we say that's a GL2 L series, whereas the ones earlier are GL1 L series. And then in general, if pi is an automorphic form on GLN, then you have an Euler product where the Euler factors all have degree N. I mean, not all, all but finally many. Okay. And then they, we are interested in the central L values of these, of these L series. Okay, now um, I wanna talk about a conjecture 
it's of interest to me. One is that you take, suppose we start with LS pi, I should say that the automorphic forms uh, subsumes in its definition the previous ones we studied, like Riemann zeta function, Dirichlet L function, as well as classical modular L functions. So if you take in general an automorphic form, pi, it's a representation, but all it is is that you take the, in the classical case, you take a modular form and then it defines a function on G mod gamma, where G is this SL2 in that case. And that function then spans by the right action of the group, a representation. And if you just work with the infinite, if you just work with the real group SL2R, then you just get a standard discrete series representation of weight K in that case. But it's sometimes useful to look at it adelically, that all it does is that it also puts in all the HECA operators. Then you get a, some representation. So anyway, if you look at in general for GLN, and you can also, um, for example, the classical L series. So whenever I talk about class, uh, yeah, again, all the L functions are normalized to go from S to one minus S. Okay. And then if you look at the functional equation, the holomorphic continuation, then you can bound the L function on two vertical lines around the critical strip. And so then if you use fragment Lindelof principle, you get a bound which is called the convexity bound, which says that L one half pi is bounded by C to the one quarter plus epsilon bounded above, where C is the analytic conductor. So I should say that the analytic, so there is an analytic conductor. This is a term used by Ioannietz and Sarnak, so I'm using the same. And, and it is a product of two conductors. It's the usual conductor that we look at like for example, gamma zero n, if you take a new form, its conductor will be n. But you will also have some something like a conductor at the Archimedean place, for example, in that case, depending on the weight k. So it's roughly like k at infinity. So you take the product and that's the analytic conductor and the L value is bounded by c to the one quarter plus epsilon. And the Lindelof hypothesis, in fact, says that L one half pi should be bounded by C to the epsilon. That's really very strong. And it follows from the grand Riemann hypothesis. And I'll have nothing to say about it because it's incredibly interesting, but very, very hard. So one thing that people have pointed out different in different applications is that you don't need the Lindelof hypothesis very often to prove certain things it's enough if you have something better than the convexity bound. So that's why it's called a subconvexity conjecture. It means that the L one half pi is bounded by C to the one quarter that which comes from the convexity, convexity bound minus delta for some delta positive. So this delta should be uniform, of course. Then um, for this family of pi, you consider typically when you consider automorphic forms, just like in geometry, you don't think of it just by itself many times, you think of it as part of some family. For example, you could classically fix a weight K and consider holomorphic cusp forms of weight K and level N. So that's one family you can look at. And then you can vary the level or you can vary the weight, et cetera. So, so it won't be just one thing, it'll be a family. And anyway, so this, in, it'll be implicit in all the things I say that you want these things to be uniform for the family. And I'm just mentioning a few things that came out of something like subconvexity conjecture. So Duke first proved, which was refined by Michelle, is that you, you can prove things like equidistribution of the imaginary quadratic points. That's what CM points are on Shimura curves and modular curves, for example. And that to prove that all you need is this subconvexity. You don't need Lindelof. Uh, and then also there's a quantum unique ergodicity conjecture where if you use the subconvexity together with some explicit formula of Watson and Ichino, then what you see is that if you take, for example, classical modular forms of weight K that I was talking about, and you look at the measure Y to the K minus two absolute value f of z squared.
Um, then, uh, sorry, <laughs> my telephone started ringing. I apologize. Um, the, so this measure f of z absolute value squared dx dy, this tends to the uniform distribution measure. So anyway, um, and I won't kind of go into that and explain anymore. I just want to say that there are also there are applications to non-vanishing problems. Some people mistakenly think that the subconvexity always imply non-vanishing. That's not true. They are really different problems, which I've realized but they have connections and sometimes you can pass information from one to the other. So anyway, it's very interesting to know subconvexity. So we were trying to prove, so what we tried to prove, my collaborators and I was to see if you can prove the subconvexity for some new class of L functions, which, which are kind of higher degree. So like Riemann zeta function is degree one, as I said, and classical modular forms is degree two. And it turns out the ones we will study are actually for over Q, it has degree 12. Okay, all right. There's also this question of positivity. So if you take the cusp form pi, you can also ask is pi, sometimes pi is the same as pi bar, if you like, which is a complex conjugate. And those are called self-dual, but Sometimes pi may, may be not quite pi bar, but it's over say an imaginary quadratic field, but it's conjugate self dual. In that case also the L function, when you view it as an Euler product over Q, it will be self dual. So another way of saying that is that an L function is self dual. In the functional equation, you relate L s to L one minus s pi of the same pi. If it's not self dual L function, then you will have to relate it to pi dual. Anyway, so the positivity conjecture says that the central value should be greater than or equal to zero, non-negative for self-dual L function. So, um, okay, so Ioannitz and Kowalski, they showed something interesting. For example, for classical Dirichlet L functions, if you take, in fact, chi corresponding to a quadratic character attached to an imaginary quadratic field. It's a Legendre symbol. And if this is non-negative for Q squared minus D, that implies that the class number is as a lower bound D to the one quarter with some implied effective constant. This is not as good as what you will get by not having Z equals zero, which implies even D to the one half minus epsilon, but this is really good and, but of course it implies this positivity. So again, somehow this is a, has a lot of consequences that are not easily foreseen at first. And Lapid and Raleigh, I should say, they proved that if you have a cuspidal generic representation of SO2 and plus one, then you do have this non-negativity. It's a trick, but it's kind of nice to have it. And for classical modular forms f, if you look at a theta series corresponding to some Grossman character chi, then you look at the Rankine-Selberg L function, L one half f cross theta chi, by Walsh-Berger, one knows that is roughly the same up to some positive factors, the square of some period. Therefore, it's greater than or equal to zero. So this is very important. And this idea has been taken quite far by Jacquet and his students. And then there's also, there's a watson ichino formula for the triple product L function for three modular forms at the center. Again, the L value is related to the square of some period. So you can deduce positivity. So anyway, I won't list all of them. I just wanted to say that positivity is known in some cases. And when it is known, it has some interesting consequences. Not always known to be have consequences, but sometimes. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about period integrals. Of course, the study of periods originated in geometry, where you take a manifold and you take a differential form and you integrate, if it's say in the homo homology class of degree n, then you take a n cycle homology class and then you integrate and what you get is the period. So that's the geometric definition but here in this context also we can define periods in general and, and many times the periods are, they do have geometric interpretation, not always. 
but many times. So this notion of periods is a little bit more general in some sense, but not as general because the, it doesn't apply to all manifolds. Okay, so then um, you take a reductive group. If you don't know what it is, just assume G is GLN or SLN or some group that you're used to or the unitary group. Then you take a subgroup and you take a cusp form and then a cusp form, we say it has period um, over H means that you just integrate over H. And when I put the bracket H, I mean the quotient, if you like in classical terms, the real Lie group H of R modulo gamma, where gamma is a congruent subgroup. So this integral, so this bracket H that I have is a sub manifold inside G mod gamma. G mod gamma, if you like, is a vibration over G mod K mod gamma, so which is really the symmetric space mod gamma. And this H mod gamma is sitting inside it, and we are integrating the form over. So this is the period. And we say that a cusp form is distinguished by H if you can find a cusp form phi in the representation space such that this is non-zero. And um, so sometimes it's related to special values of L functions due to some rank and celebrate type integral. And also sometimes it's, it gives you, so there are two reasons to study it. One is that it, it's related sometimes to special values or maybe residues of L functions, like an Asai L function in the classical case. And it also, tells you sometimes that this period when it's non-vanishing, then pi is very special. It comes from functorial transfer from some group, which group, that group may not be H itself, but it's something interesting. Okay. All right. So, um, so I wanna say just one of the periods we would be interested in is this actually the main period we would be interested in, where you take now an imaginary qu quadratic extension, it says, I'll say imaginary quadratic. Uh, then you take a Hermitian space of some dimension n plus one, and then you take a non-degenerate subspace of co-dimension one. These are dimension over E. So then you, they define unitary groups because you have, a, you can look at the subgroup of GL, which which uh, stabilizes the Hermitian form that defines the Hermitian structure. And then G is the unitary group, UV, and H is the subgroup, which is also a unitary group. And the, there is a natural embedding of H inside G via the embedding of W inside V. In fact, you can put off sometimes UW in different ways, but we're taking the most standard way of putting it. And then we're gonna take pi, uh, will be a cusp form on UV and pi prime would be a cusp form on UW. And I'm gonna assume they are tempered. It means exactly what I said earlier that the L function associated would satisfy the Ramanujan conjecture. So the Bessel period now is related to two forms, phi and phi prime cusp forms. And it's just that you restrict phi to H and then phi prime is already defined on H and you take a product and you integrate over H. So this is called the Bessel period. Vinikar here, you don't assume anything about the, the signature when you restrict to W, is that right? Right, yeah, as, as far as right now, I'm not assuming anything, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So if you take U21, for example, you could have U20 or U11, but I'm going to be interested in the case when it's U11 inside U21. I'm saying just for, to make this definition, I don't have to assume anything. All right. In my case, I would choose the signature. Yeah. Okay. Because sometimes you can't say anything. You can make a definition, but you can't prove anything. So, or it is zero. Also, I should say the periods could be for simple reasons, zero sometimes. It happens. So the, to know when it's non-zero is actually interesting. It's not trivial. It's just like if you take a differential form in geometry and you integrate over a cycle, often it seems zero. And when it is non-zero, it has some consequence. Okay, so the gone grows prasad. So it's 
So Gross and Prasad made a conjecture for first for ON plus one cross ON for the orthogonal groups. And then it was extended further by the work of Gaon and Gross and Gaon and Prasad. So now it's called GGP conjecture. So this is a very interesting conjecture. So what it says is that if you take in the same case we were looking at before, unitary groups, what happens is the unitary group has a property that which was defined relative to an imaginary quadratic field E. If you base chain, that means if you move from rationals to E, the group becomes just GL, general linear group. That's because they get split over the imaginary quadratic field, the Hermitian forms. So, so if you look at the base chain pi e pi e prime, so what they conjecture, which is very beautiful, is that this Bessel period is non-zero if and only if the central L value of the base changes pi, this is a Rankine-Selberg L function, L one half pi e cross pi e prime is non-zero. It's a very beautiful conjecture, a very general and beautiful conjecture. There's also a version for the orthogonal group and maybe some other, even some exceptional cases. So, um, okay. So, by the way, you could also think of, it looks like I've now doubled, there are two forms, but you can think of phi times phi prime in some sense as a, as a form on G, on UV cross UW. And then what we are doing here is that UW is embedded diagonally in UV cross UW. So you're taking still that form on UV cross UW and you're integrating over the its period over this. So the Bessel period is not any different from the other periods, just a special kind. Okay, so this is a very beautiful conjecture. And then Neil Harris, his first name started with an R Neil Harris, and I forget what R stands for, I apologize. He was a student of Gaon at UCSD. And he 19, I mean, 2012, he showed this true for n equals one, which is not actually completely obvious, but it's a reinterpretation of a lot of known results because U2 is very close to being GL2. In fact, SU2 is SL2, but U2 and GL2 differ because they have different types of centers. U2 center is U1, whereas GL2 center is GM. Um, then, then some cases of n equals two also he could prove this. That is when the form on U2 came from U1 somehow. Sometimes people say endoscopically. Then um, he could do that. And then Wei Zhang, he gave a refinement for general N under some local conditions. But now a recent uh, works of um, several, four people. So Wei Jiang himself and Xin Wen Zhu, my, collab, my colleague here at Caltech, and Yifeng Liu and, um, and Baza Plessy, who's in France, and they proved this global uh, conjecture for the unitary groups under the, when, when it is tempered. And then uh, they didn't also look they didn't look at some special cases like endoscopic things. And then there's another paper of Bazar Plessy and two others, and I'm sorry if I'm forgetting their names. And a year later, and they proved also the endoscopic case. And anyway, altogether, you have a formula. Not only this thing is true, but you have a formula for each of Ichino Ikeda type. So I will talk about it in a minute. So the GGP conjecture only says that when the period is non-zero, the L value is non-zero. But of course you can ask, is there a formula relating the L value to the period? And that was the Chino Ikeda formula. It's really stronger than the GGP conjecture because it gives a formula up to some factors. Um, so um, anyway, so that, all right. So Sorry, what they then, prove, then could, yeah. could I just ask in Jang's um, theorem, um, you mentioned kind of Harris's thing is kind of um, um, maybe a, um, maybe a repackaging of of known things. Is that right? Would that no? Be that's right? for n equals one. For yeah, n yeah. equals two, though, it's really new because uh, what he proved is that for n equals two, 
when the form on U2 is uh, lifting from U1, then this is true. So it's it's sort of like a Hecker character? Well, but... Yeah, the, the U2, the form on U2 is not a Hecker character, but it comes from a Hecker character of U1, yeah. So it's like an induction? Yeah, like, like the one we were looking at, you know, H1 yeah. of mm -hmm. U2, one, right? So it comes mm -hmm. from Hecker character, but it's not written as a Hecker character. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. for those cases, he could prove uh, some so some special cases. Then he could prove n equals two. So it wasn't trivial. I think it's unfortunately never published, as far as I know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it was subsumed by. I mean, Wei Jiang's result is of course much stronger, and he does general n. It's much stronger result, but he has to make some local conditions, and then his work now recently with the others. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they had to bring in a lot of new ingredients. It wasn't trivial. So it's a major result. So anyway, so th this is known and we wanted to exploit that. Maybe I should say that just very briefly, the kind of method that I'm familiar with using relative trace formula, we'll come to that. And which we worked out with my student Liang and with Philippe is that um, they give you information about non-vanishing or bounds for periods. That's what comes naturally in automorphic form. The periods come in naturally. And the fact that they are related to the L values by these people's works is very useful and we use that. So our results on L values comes as a secondary thing. First, we, in some sense, prove there are analogs of all these things I claim for just periods. And that's what we prove. Okay. Um, all right, so maybe I should say here that uh, before I talk about relative trace formula and all that, so, uh, I, okay, I do have a little more time. By the way, when it's 15 minutes, I will stop and then the, I always have more stuff to say. So if people have questions, I can ask. Okay, okay. so now if we have something co-dimension W in, like that we've been considering. And then if we use Jacquet's relative trace formula, so I will say something about it in a minute. And what happens is that any trace formula, as you know, maybe I should say something now, yeah. So what is the usual trace formula? What it is that if you look at, if you choose a test function and it acts on L2 G mar gamma, then let's ignore there is a continuous part, which is often very difficult. If you're working in the discrete part, it's mostly cusp forms. And what happens is that when you look at it, you get a kernel operator, kernel of this op operator defined by the action of the test function. And then you take the kernel function and usually you integrate the, which is the kernel function, the function of two variables. So it's really defined on G cross G, if you like. And then you restrict to the diagonal, diagonal G. That's what you usually do with the usual trace formula. And then that integral that when you restrict and you integrate the kernel over the diagonal, you can express it in two different ways. One, you can decompose the L2 space into cusp forms and then you write as a sum of cusp forms something and that is uh, plus the other discrete forms and that's called the spectral side. And then you can also expand on the other side using conjugacy classes in G, and that leads to orbital integrals. So that's called the geometric side. And Jacquet's idea, relative trace formula, is to not integrate over the diagonal, but instead integrate over, you can choose two subgroups, H1, H2, and integrate over H1 cross H2 in G cross G. And the trick is somehow if H1 and H2 are not, are not too far from G, sort of they're close enough, you can actually get some really interesting things out of it. So it's a very general idea. And in this case, we are taking H1 equals H2 equals H. So we've not, but when you do that, the spectral side gives you the following thing. What comes out of the relative trace formula is you get the Bessel period that I talked about squares divided by the normalized Peterson inner products of phi and phi prime. So, so actually, um, 
And then I told you the asymptotic Ichino. So anyway, there is an Ichino Ikeda formula. If you play with that and RSS thing, what you get is that this period square divided by the Peterson norms product is roughly equal to, and you can make it precise what the terms look like, times some positive factor times L one half pi E cross pi E prime. So by doing that, we are able to prove that enough of the L values are non-vanishing because what we'll prove that in the geometric side, asymptotically it's non-zero, which is the usual way. And so you will see that this sum is non-zero as the level increases. And that will show some non-vanishing of the periods. And by the Ichino Ikeda formula, you also get the non-vanishing for the L values. But the nice thing is the formula is so explicit that you can write it as some positive constant times the L value. So therefore you also get positivity. And then subconvexity, there is, you have to really know the exact shape of the asymptotic formula, which is more difficult. But anyway, wanted to say that all these things come out of using the relative trace formula. And the, and what they have here is the spectral side. So is E here the imaginary quadratic field? Yeah, E is the imaginary quadratic field. Yes. Okay. And and what is this? What do you get? Do you get an average of these things, or or do you get the L function on the nose? No, no. For each phi, phi. Yeah. So the the sum over phi, you get. Yeah, that's the average over all those things. But here on the nose, we have uh, the, each square of the period is roughly the L value. Okay. So are you worried? But uh, oh. But, but the positive factors vary. So the point is that I'm, I'm not being very precise. So here I have to take phi and phi prime to be special vectors, mm -hmm. you know, called the gross Prasad vectors. And you have to choose them precisely. It's like choosing new vectors. Wow. Then you can say exactly what the factor looks like and what the L value is. Mm -hmm. So what we had to do, what we had to do was really go, we went a little bit further than what they had proved because we also had to check carefully positivity at the bad primes. So there's some extra work we had to do. But, and then we use specific vectors and then for the special choice of fees, which you can incorporate in your orthonormal basis that you have this, yeah. So you do get a sum over pi of pi pi prime of the L values also times some factors. Are you wondering whether C prime depends on pi? No, no, I was wondering, oh. uh, I was wondering um, if each term corresponds to an L value, then do you get an average of L values? Yes, uh -huh. yes. Um, oh, each of them, oh yeah, that's the first thing you would do is that you'll get the average of some L values as part of it we can also isolate, but but there is a, okay, I'm also like missing some things here because I'm, is that there are these test functions uh -huh. and I'm gonna choose, I can choose the test functions. Okay, one of the reasons I'm really stating things, um, okay, I will state them precisely and then maybe it'll be clearer, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna consider only pi's that are kind of discrete series of some weight on both. And what happens is that then you can use test functions to isolate them. Mm -hmm. So you can choose, but anyway, you can um, you can isolate things mm -hmm. by using the test functions. So you can prove in fact that each L value is positive, mm -hmm. but it requires a lot of work, yeah. But a priori, like you say, you will, the first thing you'll get only is that some average is possible. But I can get rid of things by specific, especially choosing the test functions, which is hidden here in this, I'm sorry about this. And the C prime will depend on the test function as well. Okay, so now I'll say a little bit more in the special case of interest. Okay, so now, I write E as Q squared minus D, and then I'm taking only the three-dimensional vector space. By the way, when I say in the previous slide 
we prove this, et cetera, this is really only for the uh, unitary group and three variables and for V is three dimensional and W is two dimensional. So you can ask, can we prove in general? In principle, yes, but, but in practice, there are so many difficulties and this is already like over 80 pages. It's kind of complicated computations. So I don't know. I should also say, okay, and I will say that a little, a little later. Okay, so now you have a Hermitian form. G is really U21. When we write U21, usually this is only reserved for real groups, but we use this terminology to indicate that our unitary groups are quasi split, as they say. So it's like the, as split as possible. So that means that signature at infinity, it's going to be 2, 1. And then the subgroup is going to be U11, which is so that's what I was saying. I am going to choose a particular signature and you can embed G prime inside G in, in a, if you choose this J, you can write it like this. So now I'm going to, for simplicity, I'm going to assume N is an odd prime, which is inert in E. N will be the conductor of pi. N prime will become the conductor of pi prime. And I'm going to assume it's at least a hundred. There is some, there are some lots of technical difficulties. So I'm gonna assume it's large enough, but it's not a problem because we're gonna let the level go to infinity eventually. But I'm gonna take that to be an odd prime that is split in E in some sense there. So this is for simplicity. You can do a lot better, but anyway, and K will be an even integer. Um, So, um, okay, so a few more things I have to say. So I wanna state what the result is. So pi prime is gonna be, so G prime is U11. As I said, U11 is very close to GL2. SU11 is just SL2. So you can imagine pi prime, what we want is like a holomorphic new form of weight K and level N prime. On SL2, that's what it is. So it's it's a holomorphic form. Um, then you take some C, C, K, N. Now I'm gonna choose an ortho orthogonal basis on G, which is U21 with trivial character and pi infinity, I'm gonna take it to be holomorphic discrete series. So these are given by two integers on U21 and it depends, of course, on the K type, which is U2 cross U1, the weights of that. And so this is gonna weight minus K, K over two. I'm using the normalizations used by Knapp as well as Wallach, which I think is standard in level N. So, so I'm really using the weight of pi's related to the weight of pi prime. It's important to us. It's kind of interesting because in some sense, there's a little bit of a level dropping at infinity, not at other places. Now, um, so the theorem is that if you take a new form on pi prime, phi prime, then when you sum over phi, by the way, we're not summing over all phi and phi prime or nor over phi prime. I think one of the difficult parts of this theorem I think is that we are summing over the forms in the bigger group. It's a, it's somehow, it's a little easier, not much easier if you sum over smaller, the smaller group. So when you sum over the bigger group, so for example, for GL3 and GL2, GL3 cross GL2, there are results known due to different people, especially the one from Buffalo, I'm forgetting her name. And, and there they're summing usually over the smaller group, all, always over the smaller group. And here we are summing over the bigger group. And then you take this absolute value square divided by phi, phi, phi prime, phi prime. Then um, this is equal to n, so this is a formula. So there is a dominant term which looks like n squared over n minus n prime squared minus one and big O of n n prime to the minus two. And then you have this complicated looking thing um, and, ah, uh, God, that, there's something missing here. 
I, I apologize, there's something missing here. Yeah, well, I forgot to say here that K, this K has to be at least 60, I think, or yes, K has to be at least 60. So what happens is that when K is smaller than, small, very small, then some estimates become very hard to do. They should still be true, but I just feel there'll be one will have to do another 20 pages of calculation, so we avoided that. So small k, there is some delicate issue. Uh, anyway, so you have this exact formula on the right-hand side comes from the geometric side of the relative trace formula. I should say that relative trace formula of gl 2 cubed, various people have done that. Venkatesh, Fagan Whitehouse, Paul Nelson. By the way, Paul Nelson also has for un cross un minus one, a much general result where he gets subconvexity in the spectral aspect. What we are getting is in the level aspect. So it's really different. Our results, neither one implies the other, but he has a more general result for the spectral aspect. And somehow my interest is in the level aspect. Okay, so, all right. Uh, so I want to say a little bit more now, maybe hopefully this will, yeah. So as I said before, the results tell you that the Bessel period square divided by this is given by the L values times something explicit. And then here you get the sum on the left-hand side, therefore you can write this average as this thing here and um, Yeah, so on, on the right-hand side. So it, so there are a lot of things. So this is kind of tiny for suitable choice of test functions. So once you prove this is non-zero, so this is kind of, this, this is, then you get some non-vanishing results for of this, for some pi, pi prime, some, the pi prime is fixed and pi is varied. For some pi, you get non-vanishing. But if you want to prove positivity, you see something else. You don't prove it's non, then you choose vary the test function. You can try to isolate on the left-hand side, but the price you'll pay is that the right-hand side may be zero. We don't know it's not, but you can show it's greater than or equal to zero. So that's, so really you have to do it two different things. The positive, answer. positivity you already get from the first formula, don't you? Yeah. The one that, no, the, yeah, the one right up, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, this one? Um, no, no, go down. Yeah, <laughs> go up. Yeah, uh, so, so what you stated as the theorem. Yeah. That already gives you positivity, doesn't it? Apart from checking these P sharp factors. Well, positivity, if, yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. So I, the point, yeah, you're right. The positivity already follows from this, but we have to check this P sharp things. Mm -hmm. That is actually one of the worst. Yeah, okay, that's one of the worst. Things. No, I'm just trying to say what would happen if you vary test functions. See, if you, you can make, anyway, it's, I think that this is for a suitable test function that I have. So I'm suppressing the test functions. All I'm saying, if you, so choose suitable ones, then you get this asymptotic and then you can prove non-vanishing, but you don't know which pi it's non-vanishing. That's all I'm saying. Pi prime is fixed, but there are some pi's for which it's non-vanishing. So the, the uh, so let me say it again. You're given pi and pi prime, this L function could be vanished, could vanish. But if you fix pi prime, it says for some pi, as you increase the level, this is non-vanishing. Hopefully that's clear. Okay. All right, okay. What did I do? I think I should use the arrows instead of my, okay. So here's the point. I was gonna tell you that one of the things we'd prove in this P sharp is actually this, and this is also positive. And it's not obvious a priori that it's positive. And that actually is implies this, yeah. Yeah, so you're right, Kumar, yeah, okay. So, um, okay, so then in fact, what we get is that we get actually an upper bound and a lower bound. 
So you get um, this L values divided by the L1 pi add is just essentially the Peterson scalar product, inner product. So you get K and cubed plus epsilon on one side. And then the other side, you get K and to the three minus epsilon on the other side. So up to something tiny. So it's really caught between this. It's really pretty nice. And pi runs over this family. And of course, the implied constant depends on E and epsilon. Okay, so this is a, the why am I doing this? Because you, this leads to sub hybrid subconvexity. We call it hybrid because we'll see why. So now you take the L one half pi E cross pi E prime. This is bounded by K times N cubed plus epsilon N prime to the epsilon plus that. So it kind of a sum of two terms here. But now if you can choose n prime n such that k n prime cubed is greater than or equal to c n to the four plus epsilon. So, so, so you're moving n and n prime to infinity, but in a controlled way. Then you beat the one quarter convexity bound and you get subconvexity. So that's why we call it hybrid subconvexity because it's, it's not, you can't just increase n, fix n prime and increase n, we don't know what happens. But if you increase n and also increase n prime correct, appropriately, then we get this bound. Okay, and if, uh, okay, so if you think of um, um, pi prime as, as fixed, then yeah. you, have a, you have a relationship between the, the parameter k and n. Right, and, exactly. Okay, that's interesting, it's interesting. Yeah. yeah, that is, yeah, that's it, yeah, exactly. Okay, so, okay, so I'll say something more. Uh, I should have said that the conductor, uh, analytic conductor pi e cross pi e prime is k to the fourth n squared n prime to the sixth. That's what you get. So the, it to the one fourth would be k square root of n, n prime to the three half. So that's what we're able to be in this thing here. Okay, now if you vary n prime, it gets really interesting. If you vary n prime and you fix n le pi, then if you then if you fix n and then you vary n prime, then the, that condition disappears because it's going to be automatically satisfied. Then you get the L one half is bounded by n prime to the two thirds. So this gives a subconvexity when the conductor of pi is fixed in k. So <clears throat> as I was telling you, it's for some reason it's things are easier when you vary the smaller form. Than the bigger form. And the conductor is n prime to the six. So actually, the convexity bound is n prime to the three half, as we saw before. This even beats the vial bound, which is n. I'm sorry, not n, it's n prime. It should be n prime. So it's kind of interesting. You beat in this direction, you beat even the n vial bound. What's what's the vial bound? Vial bound is one sixth. You mean like the Conductor bound for the, the yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean you're okay. Well, okay, yeah. That's what people call. I don't know. Uh, I'm not an expert. You you know better. And I didn't. I never heard that before. But I I understand what you're saying. Okay. Because for the Riemann zeta function, you yep. put yep. that bound, right? Yep. So yep. therefore, they're calling it that now. Mm -hmm. Actually, I heard this by somebody used this terminology. I apologize. Then I thought, oh, it sounds good. <laughs> but all I wanted to say is it's not important. If you take the conductor to the one sixth, then you'll get n prime. But mm -hmm. we're getting even better than that. It's mm -hmm. strange. But but it seems like a general philosophy that if you take product of two forms and take Rankin Selberg and you fix the bigger one and vary the smaller one, you can get good bounds from this. Mm -hmm. But but not the other way, yeah. So anyway, okay. Here, of course, anyway, all right. So there's, we can do better than what we did, but it's okay. All right. So as a consequence on the subconvexity, you do get non-vanishing, the, num the, the set of pi, so that the L one half pi E cross pi E prime is non-zero, it has a lower bound of something. I, I don't know if it's interesting, but. <laughs> something interesting, okay.
hopefully. But anyway, it's non-zero. So there is a non-vanishing you can prove. Okay, um, I've run out of time. Maybe I should stop and ask people have questions. Uh, let's see if anybody, people are very silent. That's the problem with these Zoom talks, everybody's silent. <laughs> yeah. I, I I like to stop when the time's up because I always have more than I can talk about. So, and I don't want to rush through it. And sure. Does anyone have any questions they would like to raise at this point? Uh, so, I think the results are really, really interesting. So, you're telling me that somehow you're getting um, a power of n prime, which is less than one. Yeah. Um, so I, I fixed the, the pi, um, no, no, I fixed the pi and I'm wearing, now I'm wearing the pi prime. Is pi that prime. Right? I yeah. see, I see. And, and do you expect that to, to be the, you seem to, you seem to suggest that that's going to be true in general, that not just this U2, U3 cross, um, U, U2 case. So that's but what I think in general for UN cross UN minus one. I don't know if I want to say in general, but. But it seems to me like it's actually, yeah, that when you vary the smaller parameter, smaller group, smaller form, form on a smaller group, mm -hmm. you get something stronger. Mm. But of course, from the point of view of the smaller group, it's unnatural because you're taking the Rankin L function with something bigger. Yeah. Why yeah. would you want to do that? <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> that from the from the point of view of the larger group, it's natural. You want to look at the. So, by the way, you sort of um, could you say, uh, you your theorem is pretty explicit even in the dependence on both um, n and n prime, right? Right. Yeah. So, is in the dependence on n, is it unreasonable? I mean, is it is it way way too off or? In other words, you may not you may not get subconvexity in the n, but yeah. Um, but is it a um, is it a reasonable power? I, I've just forgot what the statement was. Oh, yeah. You mean well, the problem is that there are two terms. See, the thing is, I should say that there are two terms in our yeah. Yeah. thing. Uh, okay, and and then you see those are the exponents, so that's uh, true. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then you want to say that. So as you see at the bottom, you see that C to the one quarter will be K times square root of N times N prime to the three half. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, so, your part and of the, so the first term you see that N cubed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And then, so what and then is the other one K is, so anyway, so they're kind of neither, but somehow in the direction, if you do K N prime cubed is greater than or equal to the other one. Then in that's so in some region. So if you think of K n n prime the three dimensional space, mm -hmm. you take some region. There, if you go to infinity there, then you get subconvexity. Otherwise, you don't. But actually, I should say that the same thing happened. Even with um, some other case we looked at before, uh, like GL two cross. T, yeah. It's, yeah, I should say that I haven't mentioned a lot of people's results, but um, I apologize for that. When our paper will have all the, we'll <laughs> mention everyone. I, I, uh, um, could, could you just remind me the kappa in, in the in equation one? What is kappa? Um, it's just, uh, hopefully it's defined in here or not. It's, oh. Is it, sorry. okay, to give you a precise, Hmm, that's weird. How could I? Hold on, hold on. <laughs> uh, it's something we made up. It's not natural. 
<laughs> but it's just whatever comes yeah. in computations. It's not yeah. anything. Uh, oh, but not natural parameter, no. It's not a natural thing, no. Okay. But I wish I could. Well, at least oh. I get to show you all the pain. <laughs> yes. Do you have a question? Yes, please. Andre, you have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Mm. Hey, Andre. Um, do you have a asymptotic formula for the sum over which you're bounding or can yeah. do? Yes. Oh, you mean, uh, yeah, so. so Is it you? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we have an asymptotic formula. But I should say that, uh, so as you know, when you do the geometric side, like in this case, you see it, there's a, when you write it in terms of double coset, there's the identity double coset, unipotent, and then what we call regular, which is really, I should say, semi-regular. It's like, um, so then, then what we do is that we get exact things here for these two. So they look like, at first it looked like there were two dominant terms, but then we could prove the identity thing dominate the unipotent, the two terms. But then the regular ones we bound. So the asymptotic formula, yes, in the sense that you can write down exactly what this thing gives and this, and then bound, so. But yeah. presumably you're supposed to get a, a number which is predicted by averages of L functions and so on. Do you yes. get like two or something? Yeah, he, he got a formula in terms of the levels, right? And, and then, yeah. yeah. I have a formula in terms of N, N prime, and K, which I wrote down, I think. Hold yeah. on. But of course, you know that in the, in Venkatesh and uh, Paul Nelson's work, they, they yeah. prove asymptotic for, um, for the other problem, uh, uh, varying uh, a small, uh, actually they, they can do many, many things simultaneously. And then they uh, uh, remarkably computed and checked that it's uh, correspond to this Ichini Keda conjecture. Ichini Keda conjecture yeah. gets everything, as, as you know, right. to the constant, which is right. two to the beta and so on. And you're talking about the you're yeah. talking about the triple product case. No, no, uh, in general gross. In gross general, uh, uh -huh. So there is the, uh, this asymptotic formula produces some non-trivial or fits uh, some non-trivial arithmetic information. Yeah. And uh, I wonder if you also get this. Uh, not yes. that, that you can compute. It's usually yes. computation. Yes, somebody yes, yes. We can to. we can do exactly. Well, okay. I only read carefully his Venkatesh's paper on the triple product. So whatever he gets there, we also get. But in his case, actually, he doesn't have it completely because he didn't know exactly the at that point maybe the Ichino No, no. I'm talking about that. this paper of uh, Akshay and Paul Nelson. And, and yeah, yeah. Paul Nelson. Not yes, I know. Yeah, yeah, there I know. Exact constants there. Yeah. So you support their argument is completely different. It's not relative case formula no. at any stage. Also, I think they only get information on the spectral aspect. Yes, yes, I understand. And we are doing the level aspect. It's supposed yeah. to fit into the, the, the machinery is completely different. Yeah, no, no, I think it's fabulous what they're doing. And in fact, Paul Nelson has another preprint, as I said before, he- Which is- That convexity uh, for yes, UN yes. plus UN minus one in the spectral aspect, yes. Yeah, but you, you right. stated the formula like in, in two epsilon, plus epsilon minus epsilon. I just, want, I, I just wanted to know that you really getting an exact- Oh, I yes, yeah, we, oh no, we get exact. Okay. Yeah, 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 it's exact. It's just, it's very, okay. very complicated. And I didn't want to give it as a Zoom talk. <laughs> Absolutely, you yeah, know, it's very, it's ex it's very precise. Yes, everything we do, we completely compute. There's nothing, yeah. Great. Uh, except for the one proviso I mentioned before, we take at this point the weight k to be at least sixty or something. And Great. what oh, happens if the weight is really small? Then there are some com computations in the regular terms. That are really difficult at the bad primes. It's a local computations. It's very complicated. Yeah. 
It should well, be true even there. But outside that, I think we get an exact formula for everything. Yeah, I'm writing in terms of epsilon because it's easier to write. 